Well, Father, again, we just thank you for this evening, Lord, and just this time to gather with you and with one another, and Lord, to open your word. And now, Lord, we just ask you to guide us through it, help us to make sense of what we read, give us discernment and wisdom. Lord, as always, just help us to find application where it's there for our lives and our day. So we just yield to your presence and your purpose tonight, Lord. Ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 14. So tonight what we'll find is that John, John brings us back into the drama of, of this story. And what we saw in the last two chapters was actually a pause in that drama. Because what happened during those two chapters was just an unveiling, an introduction, a highlight of the main characters of the time frame that we're looking at in the future. So moving forward now, we're going to see the gospel proclaimed to the world. And the fall of Babylon is announced. And most exciting is that we have the appearance of the Son of Man to judge the world and tread the winepress of the wrath of God. I love that phrase. We're going to see that alluded to throughout this chapter. And this chapter also serves as a summary in advance of chapters 15 through 19. So a lot going on in this chapter, its uses, its purpose. So let's take a look at the first few verses. John writes, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing with their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the hundred and 44,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So we see the lamb, who we know is the Lord, standing on Mount Zion, and he's got 144,000 followers, all of whom were sealed on their foreheads. And this scene looks forward to that time when Jesus comes back to the earth and stands in Jerusalem with this group of believers. Now, we lost, last saw, and I'm sure you remember, these 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. And there they were identified as a group of Jewish believers who would minister during the tribulation period. And we were told then, as we're reminded here, that they were provided a seal of protection, and that, was, that mark was given to them on their foreheads. Now, seeing them standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb, it's evidence that they will emerge victorious. Covering that they had takes them through the great tribulation period. And then we read that they have the Lamb's Father's name written on their foreheads. And we spoke previously about how Satan counterfeits that with his mark, which will be given on the forehead or the right hand, it says. And so he can't come up with anything original. He's got to do something that God's already done, but he can't do it as well for sure. You know, the whole concept of the name of the Father being written on them. And I was, I was reading some, some Spurgeon, and I came across this observation that he made. And he said, And who were these people, having his Father's name written in their foreheads? Not B's for Baptists, not W's for Wesleyans, not E's for the established church. They had their Father's name and nobody else's. What a deal of fuss is made on earth about our distinctions. We think such a deal about belonging to this denomination and the other. Why, if you were to go to heaven's gates and ask if they had any Baptists there, the angel would only look at you and not answer you. If you were to ask if they had any Wesleyans there or members of the established church, he would say nothing of the sort. But if you were to ask him whether they had any Christians there, I, he would say, an abundance of them, and they are all one now, all ca called by one name. The old brand has been obliterated, and now they, ha they have not the name of this man or the other. They have the name of God, even their father, stamped on their brow. Yeah. Boy, we're going to look back on the division of this world, I think, and just shake our heads, especially the division in the church, how bad it really has happened over the years. 
So we see this scene unfolds on Mount Zion. And of course, Zion really just speaks of the hills that makes up Jerusalem. And it's there that the Messiah will gather his redeemed and reign over the earth. Now, I'm entertained by this. Notice how this scene comes with a soundtrack. Along with John's, with what John sees, he also hears. He hears God's voice, comparing it to many waters and thunder. There's the sound of harpists playing before the throne. And then a new song being sung before the throne. I like the fact that it's a new song. Because it's really a time where they're being taken into something that's never been before. Now, a question I would ask is, John witnessing the hosts of heaven joining together with these 144,000 in worship? Because it seems like he's got a, a, this time he's kind of got a picture of what's happening on earth and what's happening in the throne. They sing a new song, again, because they're singing about something that's never happened. And not only does God inhabit the worship of his saints on earth, but those that worship God are lifted into the heavens to join in worship before the throne. I think it's something so important to consider when we're worshiping. That it's not just us in this room, not just us in this room and every other church that's meeting at the same time, but when we enter into worship, we're entering in with the host of heaven. We're worshiping along with them. It's why... I think worship has to be taken seriously. It is not just something we do at the beginning of church or something we do, you know, before church starts. No, that's part of our service. And that's part of what we come to do is to worship. You know, the the, the thought in the car that, oh, they're still doing worship. I'm not late yet. It's the wrong thought. Because there's so much... so much ministry of the Lord to us when we worship. We're we're ministering to him, our hearts, but he's ministering to us in that time frame. You know, I've shared this before that it was years ago that I started to wake up to how many people um, suffered with anxiety. And I was truly ignorant of that condition. And and at first I was ignorant to the point of being cruel in my thinking because I I I was like, well, just stop, you know, just stop, you know. And I look back on that, and I'm kind of ashamed that that was my first thought. But I didn't realize how serious it was, especially to the person going through it. And the first couple of times I met with someone who had that, <clears throat> I had no idea what I was going to say because I had no experience in it. I mean, if I, I can say I've had a panic attack before, but not, not, not that feeling that people have when they're in anxiety. But the Lord told me in that moment with that first person, and I've said it many times to others along the way, you need to have a life of worship. You need to learn to worship, even when you're by yourself, because you cannot truly worship God and have anxiety. You may have it at the beginning, but it will be removed as you worship. Um, It's just a fact. I stand on that. I believe it with my whole heart. So it's not just singing songs. So it's a matter of giving God our hearts and receiving from his. You know, that, that just thinking about what I just said, you know, that's something that we can only learn here on earth. You know, when we're there, we're, we're going to already be part of what's happening there. But that's just something that we have to learn here. And, and that's great because that means we don't have to wait to heaven to find the reasons to praise him. We have all the reasons right now. Let's look at verse 4. These, speaking of the 144,000, are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. I think there's a song there. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, I see this mention of virginity of the 144,000 as simply a symbol of their general purity. Being described as virgins, we learn they've not defiled themselves with women. They've kept themselves free from the terrible idolatry and the immorality of that time that they're in. They follow the lamb in unquestioning obedience and devotion. They'll not accept the lie of the Antichrist, the lie that a mere man was to be worshipped. They'll remain blameless in their steadfast confession of Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
I mean, you think about these guys. This is these hundred forty-four thousand. They'll serve as the living example of what being sanctified really means. They're set apart. They're set apart, unlike any other group, I really think. And then as much as human service can, they'll be holy as he is holy. They have, they have an incredible ministry. And I wish we knew more about it. You know, we get to this point. We, we met them. They were sealed. Now here they are standing with the Lord. It's like, like okay, a lot went on in between. Where's that chapter? Guess we're not supposed to know. Let's pick up a verse 6. And here, here with verse 6, we get into these three angels and the messages that they bring. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. Now the angel flying in mid-heaven with the everlasting gospel seems to correspond to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And there we read, and this gospel of the kingdoms will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. That's an important verse for all kinds of reasons. One of the big reasons that that, that is such an important verse because it tells you exactly when the end will come. It doesn't tell you the day nor the hour. We can't know that. But it kind of tells you the conditions. Let me read it again. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. And I, and I stress that because there's so many things that come up, that have come up, that are happening today where you could say, man, this is the end. I mean, we're more so than in decades. Right now, we're sitting just literally on the precipice of a nuclear confrontation. Right this moment, in case you're not following the news. I mean, right now, Russia's military is on the highest level of readiness. What we, we in our military, we call DEFCON 1, Defense Condition 1. They're at DEFCON 1, whatever they call theirs. Their nukes are ready to fly. And we just hit them again tonight. The Brit, we used British missiles. And they know. I mean, Putin knows. People in Ukraine can't fire those. Only the countries that own those missiles can fire them. They, they, their people can't. Most of them are satellite controlled. Only we. So we are literally, literally now at direct conflict with Russia. And Putin is threatened. The only hope, I think, right now is that Putin today said that he's actually willing to negotiate for peace with Ukraine if President-elect Trump is the negotiator. So I think he's going to become president a lot earlier than January 20th. Of course, he's been president since 2020. 2016, excuse me. Now, the subject of the gospel here, it's, gi it's given in verse 7 of our text. Men are commanded to fear God rather than the beast, to give glory to God rather than to the idolatrous image, and to worship God rather than a mere man. Of course, there's only one gospel, the good news of salvation through faith in Messiah. And during the Great Tribulation, the gospel will also work to turn men away from worship of the beast and prepare them for Messiah's kingdom on earth. And we got to note that the gospel doesn't change over time or vary due to circumstances. But what I do believe happens with the gospel is the weight of the message increases during judgment. And during the hour of judgment, it's as if God puts his foot on the scale to increase the urgency and underline the importance of the message. And I think that's what will be, that is what we're witnessing here during the tribulation period. It'll mean more than it's ever meant in a sense because this situation has never occurred. Things have never been this dark on the earth. Look at verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So another angel announces Babylon's fall. And this announcement looks ahead, and we'll get into it much more detail in chapter 17 and 18. For now, it's enough to see it's representing mankind 
in organized rebellion against God. And when we're told that Babylon has led all nations into fornication, the main idea is spiritual fornication. And remember, the tribulation period is going to see a one-world religion. So Babylon represents an apostate Judaism, an apostate Christendom, which will be a vast commercial and religious conglomerate. And again, we'll talk more about that in those coming chapters. So this world system will fall with all nations drinking the wine of the wrath of their fornication. In verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So here we're reminded again of a really important distinction. There's a super important connection between worshiping the beast, worshiping the image, and receiving his mark on the forehead or the hand. And we got to see that. Why, do, why is that so important? Because it tells us that no one will casually or accidentally take the mark. Okay? Now, we look back into the, you know, the COVID nonsense years and how many people jumped to chapter 13 and tried to associate the shot with the mark. And as I've said a couple times during this study, okay, so how did you skip all the other chapters? And it, if that were, let's just say it were that, it would have had to come with the worship of the beast and the worship of his image. So there has to be a lot at play for, those, for, that, for that final part of that to, come, to, to be realized. And again, we have to be the people that can talk the truth in the sense into those situations because I personally am not going to be surprised when the next one comes. Well, let me, let me, let me, I'll just throw this out. This here's my guess. If we can't get World War III or World IV, depending on how you look at it, if we can't get this started, which they're trying to do, the neocons are working really hard to get this war started. If they can't get that done, I think we're going to see another pandemic. And it's probably going to be the bird flu. N, N5N1. I think I said it. Doesn't matter. Um, so I believe the connection between worshiping the beast and taking the mark will be absolutely clear. And I think we can safely guess the time of the third angel's pronouncement as being in the middle of the tribulation, at the beginning of the great tribulation period. The angel warns that any who agrees to worship the beast in any of its forms will suffer God's wrath then and then eternally. And the wine of his wrath will be poured out on the earth during the great tribulation but that will only be a foretaste of eternal hell, where the devil, his angels, and unbelievers shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. This is verse 10. Actually, let's read verse 10 again and add verse 11. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So this reminds us that hell consists of eternal and conscious punishment. The Bible never teaches that the wicked, that, that the wicked dead will be annihilated. The smoke of their torment ascends perpetually, and there is no relief day or night. And here's another thing, in case you didn't catch it. Verse 10 also proves that God is not absent from hell. The challenge is that often heard description that hell is the absence of God. You've probably heard someone say that in your Christian walk. That that's, that's one of the things that ter that, that's so terrifying about hell is that God's not there. On the contrary, he's present in all his holiness and righteous judgment. Read it. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence, in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. 
The fact is, those who are in hell will wish God was absent. But he will not be. So it's wrong to say that hell will be without the presence of God. But listen, it will be without any sense of his love. That'll be the difference. The inability to connect with him. The inability to be reconciled to him. Now, is he, I'm not saying he's literally in hell, so don't go down that road. But his presence, he's omnipresent. That, that doesn't change. He doesn't suddenly like shut a door that he never goes to again. So the presence of Jesus will be there, but only the presence of his holy justice and wrath against sin. Look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The tribulation will be a time when the saints will be called to endure patiently the savagery of the beast, to obey God by refusing to worship a man or an idol, and to hold fast their confession of faith in Jesus Now, the eventual death of the wicked serves to encourage the faithful to endure. And that may be just one of the few things that those that come to faith then will have to hold on to, is that they know the wicked are being judged and it will come to an end. Look at verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So believers who died during the period that we're looking at will not miss the blessings of the millennial kingdom. You know, man may say, blessed are the living, but God says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. And then we read that their works follow them. So that's, again, a great thing for us to know now. That everything done for Jesus and in his name for others will be rewarded. You know, every kindness, sacrificial gift, every prayer, tear, word of testimony, God will bless those things. Those things will follow us. We don't suddenly lose our entire earthly life when we're there with him. Let's pick up in verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on that cloud sat one like the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, we can entertain more than one interpretation here. Some find it difficult to see Jesus as the one gathering the harvest here, reaping. They have a hard time seeing Jesus responding to an angel who come out of the temple loudly crying in his direction. But it's unlikely that someone called the Son of Man who's wearing a golden crown is anyone but Jesus. And now if we compare this passage with Matthew chapter 13, verse 39 and 43, and then Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, we learn that the harvest of the earth takes place at the second coming. And we're told there in Matthew that it's the angels that are the reapers. So look, let's just read one of those passages, Matthew 13, 39 and following. It says, the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him. So what do we conclude? Jesus does do the reaping, but through the agency of the angels. Now, before we leave these verses, I I want to consider these words. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. When you go into the ancient Greek, the word for ripe has this negative sense, and it means to become dry or withered. So the idea here is of something that is overripe, meaning God will judge the earth only when it's overripe for judgment. I think that's interesting. It tells us something 
about his character. God doesn't rush his judgment, and he doesn't waste his wrath. And in my mind, this likely points to things getting much worse, much more ripe, between now and the time that the Lord comes. We shall see. Look at verse 19. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So the mature, overly ripe grapes are gathered and thrown into the great winepress of God's wrath. And then the trampling of the grapes in the process of making wine is used here as a picture of that crushing judgment. And this vintage takes place outside the city of Jerusalem, perhaps in what is known as the Jezreel Valley. And you may also know that as the plain of Megiddo. And we associate that location with Armageddon. We talk about the Battle of Armageddon. That's where this is speaking of. And that term Armageddon, it comes from a Hebrew phrase, Har Megiddo, which means Mount Megiddo. And there's not actually a Mount Megiddo when you, when you go there. When you're down in that valley, um, this name refers to, the, to an accumulation of archaeological layers in the ancient city of Megiddo. When you go there, it, it's a place called Tel Megiddo. And when you're there, it, it's, it's, ex, uh, you know, it's been, been dug and dug and dug over the years. And, and it, you go to this one place and you see the layers. It just goes down and down. It's this massive hole. And it's 20, like 20 different layers of, of, where, of where it's been inhabited, laid on top of one another in, in that area. It's been excavated to, the, to those previous habitations. So in Revelation chapter 16, when we get to it, John will be describing a future battle between good and evil gathering at a place called Armageddon. And so that, that is the focus here. And many scholars believe this refers to Jezreel Valley, specifically the site of Megiddo, due to its historical significance and a strategic location. And it is plenty big to have this battle. It's been a, been a scene of battles in the past. And I, and I think about it, I've seen it, I've seen it from on high from two different places. I've looked across you know, this valley from Mount Carmel, and then I've seen it from the mountains of Jordan looking back into Israel. And, and it's like looking into the Grand Canyon in the sense you just can't comprehend how big it is. But it is a battlefield, I'm telling you. It is set up for a huge, significant war. Now we read here that at the time of this wrath, the carnage in that valley will be unimaginable. We can't fathom what we're reading. here. The carnage will be so great that the blood will flow in a stream some 200 miles long and as deep as a horse's bridle. That's kind of hard to comprehend. That would reach all the way from Jerusalem Jerusalem to the south of Jordan. That's a, that's a sea, a sea of blood. And then I always wonder when I read this here, or I'm in Ezekiel chapter 39, looking back the other way, you know, is that what I'm? Is that is that that battle? Does Ezekiel 39 actually describe this battle, the the, the battle at Megiddo? Some believe it does. Some believe this will actually happen before the tribulation. There's, there's many interpretations. You know, but let, let's just for the just, just just to remind ourselves of what that battle looks like in Ezekiel, and how it could tie into this, or maybe two different battles, but they both look the same. I mean, war is war. Um, but from Ezekiel thirty nine, I'll start in verse ten, and it says, "They will not take wood from the field, nor cut down any from the forest, because they will make fires with the weapons, and they will plunder those who plunder them." and pillage those who pillage them. It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will obstruct travelers because they will bury Gog in all his multitude. Therefore, they will call it the valley of Haman Gog. So one of the things we have this picture of is they're going to burn the weapons. And, they're going to burn, and it says they're going to burn the weapons for seven years, which seems to place it kind of nicely at the beginning right before the tribulation, and have those seven years of burning them, which would kind of remove it from being the battle of Armageddon. 
I don't know. And then it goes on and it says, well, come, no, it says, no, it says for seven months, the house of Israel will be burying. So for seven months out of this battle, it's going to take to bury all of the bodies. And if those two conflicts are the same, that, that kind of speaks to the amount of blood that is shown. there. And it says, indeed, all the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. They will set apart men. And this is one of those particular scenes that is interesting. They will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land, and when anyone sees a man's bone, he shall set up a marker by it till the buriers have buried it in the valley of Haman God. Why would they be that concerned about the bone? Unless we're dealing with a radiated situation, and they're cleansing the land of all, the, all that's, been, that's happened to it via some sort of weapon. And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal on the mountain of, mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. So they're calling the animals to come in and help clean the scene. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. You shall eat fat till you are full and drink blood till you are drunk at my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. So again, I'm not trying to say this is the battle. Some believe it is. We don't really know where it places, but although there's some time frames that have to be dealt with, it'd be very hard to have that battle in the midst somewhere second half of the tribulation than have those years, you know, those seven years to burn everything off. But like I said, war is war, and it's a good picture no matter what. This battle, we could almost picture it in what could be coming soon. You know, I mean, is this that war that we're sitting on the precipice of? I don't know. There's great questions about that. We know it's going to be significant, though. You know, earlier in this chapter, it talked about the 144,000 singing a new song. And... I was wondering, as, if you, as we went through this chapter, was there a song that we sang as kids that was coming up in your mind? Remember that song, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory of the Coming of the Lord is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. His truth is marching. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. Nope. Saying that when I was young, I had no idea what it was about. Pretty cool. Maybe that's what the 144,000 were singing. I don't know. I doubt it. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening, for this chapter, Lord. And Lord, I apologize for getting us maybe too far into the weeds on some things. Lord, it's so hard not to wonder. But Lord, just help us to stay on a path that you have set, to, to know what we need to know and to be clear about what we need to be clear about. Lord. So give us a great discernment for your word as we continue towards the rest of this book. Lord. Just uh, glorify your name tonight, Lord. Thank you that we can look forward to the day when the wicked will be finally, finally put under. So I just ask you to get us home safe in this nasty weather, Lord, and prepare us for tomorrow. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name.